as the topic. Okay, hello everybody. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm even maybe gonna put on a timer. I'm vaguely uh, aware that I don't super go over time. So, I am Irina Bolshevsky. I've spent a little over 10 years working in tech and I started in kind of startups and companies and then non-profits um, and then government, inside government, outside government um, and currently I'm a consultant sort of specializing in product strategy, policy, leadership in sort of data, privacy and decentralization and I, I founded a thing called Redecentralize and um, I want to talk about kind of how did I get into the open movement and thinking about open source. So the very first open source project that I worked on was called CCAN. This sort of slightly awkward acronym actually stands for Comprehensive Knowledge Archive Network. Very catchy term uh, that was borrowed from, the, from CPAN, Comprehensive Pearl Archive Network. And uh, it has actually very little to do with what the kind of current users of CCAN understand it uh, to be. And over time, we kind of quietly pretended that it's not really an acronym, it's just a name. But the truth is out there. It's on Wikipedia, and I'm telling you now, so this is, this is what it is. And when I crossed paths with CCAN, it didn't really have a website. It was sort of an open source project. Uh, there was a GitHub repository. Um, the kind of first description I got of it was, a package manager with a solar index and a Postgres database. And I was like, brilliant. Who is it for and what does it actually do uh, for, for people outside of that? And, um, you know, but it was sort of one of many, many projects at Open Knowledge Foundation, which was an international nonprofit um, that was trying to kind of open up all kinds of uh, things in, from data to open science to um, to kind of government transparency and accountability. And CCAN's point was to kind of really facilitate open data discovery. And its funding was actually primarily from the UK Cabinet Office. So um, they managed to get a contract to essentially provide some back-end functionality for this new data.gov.uk site that was publishing government uh, data, primarily spending data which they had to publish um, as open data through a data portal. So CCAN wasn't really a very visible bit of it, um, although on this page you can see that little API link is actually goes to CCAN and um, they had a kind of full-time staff of Drupal developers that were very keen to kind of extend the Drupal functionality of the website and given that essentially there wasn't a contractual arrangement in place between the cabinet office and open knowledge, this was sort of, we weren't cashing in on the 10 year procurement um, contracts that you can sometimes get with government and CCAN was open source, there wasn't really anything that was ensuring the government had to use, keep using CCAN or in fact keep using open knowledge foundation to uh, support it. We also had the data hub which was this community site for sharing open data between people and enthusiasts who cared about uh, open data and kind of linked to open data cloud, used it quite extensively. But it was quite a difficult site to use. It was more functional than pretty, even for sort of 2011, um, which is sort of this picture is probably from. And most of the users didn't really know much about the features that Zcan had, many of which were unfinished or unpolished but actually quite extensive and quite powerful and fundamentally hidden in sort of extensions of GitHub. Um, and there wasn't really a long-term business model. So, whatever, what we did have and what was really clear was the kind of mission. We had an organization with a plan. We wanted to kind of increase government accountability and increase the, the quantity and quality of open information to empower people to make decisions based on good data. And we really cared about having open tools for open data, which is why CCAM was open source. But it was really very much kind of running like a, a sort of traditional open source project without sort of much um, 
kind of focus on the kind of marketing or sales side or positioning <coughs> or uh, product stuff. So I was the hired as a product owner and I was the only non-developer on the team. And the challenge that I sort of set myself was to make an open source solution the default for open data publication, ideally around the world, and to ensure that it can be a sustainable venture. So that, that was really what I decided needed to happen next. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the things that I tried and what were some of the things that worked. So the kind of one of the first interventions I started with was actually to start talking about what this software uh, platform and its various descriptions actually did. And really starting to think, moving from features to sort of meaningful um, explanations of what it allowed users to do and which users did it actually focus on. So um, I kind of took what probably was the slightly controversial decision at the time to really focus on government users. So we had a lot of different uh, organizations at the time who thought about that there'll be like a marketplace for data. And there was an organization called Buzz Data that I think eventually ran out of funding and didn't manage to make money. Um, but governments were starting to get into open data. So kind of condensed down the feature set to two very specific things and targeted the, the functionality towards those types of users and created loads and loads of slide decks. Um, that didn't work. Uh, and different marketing materials. This was like one of the very earliest, slightly awkward uh, explanations that we tried about what CCAN did because really at the time it wasn't very it wasn't very clear and we tried to start thinking about well actually we have these two very different uh, types of users people who are actually publishing data and people who are actually trying to consume data and what are the different functionalities um, that they need and 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 why is that meaningful to them um, there's actually interestingly a third type of user which is the people with the money who signs off the budget? Um, okay. With this kind of newfound narrative and focus, the next kind of key thing that, oh no, don't do that. This is, it might come back. The next key thing we, we focused on was to convince the UK government. This is why I don't use my laptop usually. What do you think I should do? We can assume it might come back, and if not, you guys have the internet. Most of this is out there. You can type in day.gov UK. I blame the new USB C ports. Never, never do it. It's like been the worst mistake of my life. It seems to be like you really have to have it tightly in there. So it's ridiculous. It's yeah. It's because it's it's because I didn't shell out for the Apple version. That's what happened. Um, ah. Okay. Don't breathe. <laughs> Keep breathing. Sorry. Don't get want to get sued. Uh, so kind of armed with this new focus on users and features and much more targeted things, went in and convinced the UK government to switch to CCAN on the front end. So this is kind of started what it looked like when they actually used uh, CCAN, not sort of behind an API with Drupal on top, but on the front end. And um, also applied for the kind of data portal tender for the European Commission, who are also starting to think that open data is the new oil and the future of everything. Um, and we redesigned the interface. So I had a really small team 
myself as the kind of product person, a designer, a front end person, and a back end person, really we kind of invested, scraped out some time to rethink the information architecture to ensure that the, the interface was consistent and prettier and actually just start creating something that looked like a much more modern web app and created a demo site with the new interface. Um, we, I also kind of decided that the key thing to do was to go after a big name, so got, went after the, UK, the US government, data.gov, and over time convinced them that what they really needed was to obviously switch to CCAN as a solution to, to, to all their problems. And um, uh, kind of from then on, having developed, um, having managed to get these key users and features, um, I then mostly did a lot of talking and running workshops about open data, about CCAN, all over the world. Um, one of the other key things that we really did was had a very active um, mailing list, a technical mailing list, so people would, because it was open source, people were trying, to, trying it out, installing it everywhere, and it often uh, wasn't as easy because it was quite complicated software, but we always had people responding or people from the community responding, so we had a really kind of um, interactive experience with people, and we had many workshops around the world with developers. And we ensured that every new client actually funded new features. So when we worked with the US government, we spent a lot of that time and funding to really push the boundaries of what CCAN was able to offer. And in this case, this is a, a bunch of geospatial functionality that meant that geospatial data was uh, presented much more tangibly and visibly. And this was built kind of in extensions to the software that were generic that every other person who used the software could use. Um, so, the other key thing that uh, Alistair actually talked about before, but I think is really important, was we started really positioning ourselves as this software isn't just an open source project that someone kind of cooked up when they were a bit tired and feeling idealistic about the world. This is something that is being supported by a team uh, who are professional, who know what they're doing. You can buy support packages, you can, you can kind of get consultancy, customization, and you can also have it hosted. So actually having that framing um, be really sort of kind of on that level reassured people that they, especially governments who were quite afraid of the open source and really wanted to be quite risk averse about the software that they bought, that they could use ECAN and rely on it. Um, but it also meant that we as a team kind of were quite clear on what to go after and, and what we can do and how do we make it sustainable. So those are the kind of the key things that happened. And in that time, that was sort of one or two years, actually CCAN quite quickly became a standard for open data. So it started getting written into government procurement frameworks for open data sites. Um, it became internationally more famous than its parent organization, Open Knowledge. And it had a really healthy turnover that actually supported not the team itself, but the larger organization at the time. So when I left, there were over 100 uh, live instances of CCAN and kind of in community government sectors, but also CCAN was actually the official platform uh, par you know, software of choice that was being used by 25 nation states for their open data portal. So this, like in this sort of scheme of open source projects, was a very, very successful open source project. It was being kind of recognized internationally and taken very seriously. And um, you know, now there's 146 instances uh, registered on the site. But fundamentally, in quite a short period of time from when I joined to when I sort of left the team, we were basically relying on inbound sales. People were coming to us. People were coming to me essentially saying, please, uh, send a request for proposal for this tender or we're interested in some hosting or support or something else. Uh, the sort of the dynamic was actually really good and it wasn't the case that we had to kind of run around with a big sales team. I was basically doing all of the sales and uh, all of the pricing um, for, a, for, a, for a quite a large uh, budget towards the end. So um, with time and perspective, what do I think really worked? 
And uh, I think primarily, the key things that I would say is targeting really specific markets. So it's really easy to, especially when you want to build something open source and build something that works for lots of people, to keep that open, to say, actually, this could be used for this and this and this, and it can be used for everything. But in my experience, um, essentially being quite brutal and deciding, you know what, national governments are the people that we will go after because um, with local government, there's a lot more competition. So at the time that I'm talking about, there was a kind of US VC funded company that had raised, I think, 80 million in, the, in their first or second round that was actively competing for sort of SaaS hosted solutions. And it was really difficult to out compete with them because they would just give people it for free for the first year, which we simply couldn't afford to do. Um, but it w they would own the infrastructure, they would own all the stuff. And once the kind of government was invested, they would uh, um, essentially ramp up the prices over time. So having that t sort of understanding that uh, market and really targeting who we went after was really important. The political drivers um, also played a really big part. So the organization as a whole was pushing for more openness and more transparency and more open data. So the other parts of open knowledge um, reinforced the various kind of incentives and the, and the possibilities. We also had a project called School of Data that would teach data journalists to write stories based on open data to actually start closing the feedback loop between government opening the data and there actually being accountability because people are writing about um, the fact that the budget and the spending data doesn't add up and the money's gone somewhere, which uh, was quite an interesting set of stories in Brazil. So reframing the features and functionality in terms of uh, what it actually enabled users to do um, worked. Making it prettier worked a huge amount. I was actually shocked by how much just having some nice interfaces and having a demo site changed people's relationship to what the thing was. So it wasn't a huge amount prettier, and it's quite dated now. Uh, but the, the interface that we designed over like, quite a short period of time is still the one in use. And in fact, smaller governments still use that. But we also rethemed it, making the theming much easier. And um, the other key thing that we did was we actually had a really specific narrative for the people who had to make the decisions and had the budget. Um, some of the other organizations in the space only had that narrative and didn't think about the kind of direct users at all, which also worked for them. Um, we had more of a balance, but that was a really important part to understand where the money is coming from in the ecosystem and actually ensure that there is a message for that money. And the other thing that I think is that really the biggest um, the biggest thing that really worked was actually just the buzz around what we were doing. All of those events and workshops kind of created an awareness and an excitement about the thing that, that in some ways potentially isn't very exciting. It's a kind of uh, an open data portal. But when, you're kind of part, when you frame it in the context of a bigger movement, um, it was something that people could really feel like was authentic and they could get behind. We also had quite famous uh, users. So obviously, we're between the UK government, the US government, the EU, and then Australia, Canada, Brazil, um, we ended up being on the kind of must contact list for any other governments thinking about open data. We also invested quite a lot in the technical community. We had lots of kind of allies, so civic tech communities around government in different countries because it was open source, because they could check out the software and really interact with it, would then support and kind of push their governments to actually consider using open source in a, in a way that um, previously they hadn't been able to. The pricing was realistic. And um, yeah, I think that we really all kind of had this kind of internal alignment and message around open tools for open data. And the, the fact that it's really important. And I, I'm going to mention team and environment at the end as well. So there was a few things that didn't really work, probably lots of things, but the kind of things that jump out at me is that we never really invested enough back into the team. So we knew that we wanted more people in the kind of non-tech side. We knew we wanted 
to do a lot more core work and refactoring and kind of making the whole thing easier. But we were always essentially doing consultancy or client work. And there was never really that much funding for just investment. And as part of a non-profit and as the only profit-making part of the organization, we were often subsidizing other parts of it. We didn't really do user research or service design or product management properly in a kind of prop, in a really <coughs> full, um, wonderful way because there were there, a lot of the time there wasn't the time and energy, and we didn't uh, manage to make SaaS work. So there was too much competition for the kind of plug and play hosted model, and we did quite a lot of sales on that, but that didn't end up being this beautiful sustainable revenue stream where people would buy hosted instances that we didn't really have to do much about and then we could then use the money to invest in other things. The last thing that I think was quite interesting that I tried was actually creating a CCAN association. So we always thought we have all these users, um, there's all, all these governments who depend on this software, surely they have this vested interest in actually sustaining it and supporting it long term. Um, you know, the maintenance, the updates, security updates, and all this sort of thing. So I, I had sort of at the time met the director of the jQuery Foundation, and he was telling me about how they set it up and the membership models. And one of the things that I started was the CCAN Association. And the learning there was no one would give us any money. So lots of governments would give us people. And if you look at the website, there's lots of gold member tier uh, countries in the mix and governments, but basically none of them actually were willing to set aside budgets. So it was, it was a thing that really didn't quite work out. And it was really hard. Right, so um, what I wanted to kind of talk about after that is, um, so that was kind of what really worked and didn't work for CCAN, but afterwards I worked uh, in a few other different bits of an organization, so I worked on the senior management team of Open Knowledge as a whole and did a lot more sort of funding and grant funding. I've worked at the W3C, at the Open Data Institute, uh, inside GDS, which is government, and lots of things have increasingly in my career been open source or at least open companies. And many of my friends work in civic tech, they work in my society or open healthcare or scrape wiki. So I have kind of have some reckons I wanted to generally share about uh, the sustainableness of open. And although we might not have a huge amount of time for this now, but what I but basically I split this into four buckets because um, I think four, four seems good. And it broadly went from sort of small amounts of money to large amounts of money, uh, internally generated funding to sort of externally generated funding. And if you Essentially, you want to have, if you want to fund anything, there's sort of four broad ways. So one is sort of unpaid labor, essentially, or self-funded. Uh, this is actually incredibly common. Uh, so some of this goes on in many, many open source projects and, and many kind of open movements. And this might be just people doing things in their spare time or kind of doing consultancy um, to fund their kind of long-term thing, you know, contributing having interns, you know, side hustling, all of that things. Uh, selling, sort of products, consultancy, hosting services is the most common. So that's the traditional route for open source. And, you know, you're either selling time, so you're kind of customizing something for somebody, you're giving them advice, um, or, you're, or you have some kind of product or service. So there's like a hosted version, analytics, or you know, in the kind of non-open source work, anything from selling books to to, to a bank, uh, to banking services, uh, goes into sort of selling things. The many micro funding uh, is essentially things like membership fees, which could be uh, small amounts. Uh, or yeah, so crowdsourcing or, or donations, basically small amounts, but generally from lots of people and lots of sources that you don't have a direct relationship with. So it's it's people that you don't know, and it might be people you've never met. Um, and lastly, the kind of macro funding, uh, larger amounts, usually from very few, but well-known sources and people that you have a direct relationship with. So this could be anything from taking on investments, 
getting some kind of grant funding, getting government funding, uh, having an endowment or trust fund. And I wanted to kind of briefly talk about um, all of these. So, and if they, oh yeah, I also put IPOs and ICOs on there, but I'll kind of mention them, mention them later. Um, they don't really fit in, but also increasingly this has become a kind of meaningful sort of funding. So, if you talk, think about unpaid labor or self-funding sort of volunteer-led uh, projects, um, most open source projects are like this. In the kind of civic space world, Democracy Club, Recentralized, I run. Um, and the really great thing about this is that if you have people, you can just start straight away. There's no sort of run-up time. You have passion, you have community, you're working on a cause. There's usually a really great alignment, but it's incredibly hard to sustain. Um, it's not very dependable. Um, most people kind of move on or you rely on one person. They might get sick or they might get run over by a bus. And you, you kind of really need to work at it. So there's lots of work that has to go into sustaining uh, volunteer-led sort of projects. And you tend to have this rule of actually 90% of people are just lurkers. They're kind of checking in. They're saying, oh, is this interesting? Is this worthwhile? And only really 1% are really committed, heavy contributors in a given community. So the numbers have to be really big to actually have enough people to do something really important with. If you think about products, sort of the selling things, um, so CCAN, my society, uh, lots of kind of most open source projects, but also other types of organizations that are open source led um, use this as a kind of primary source of funding and it's quite reliable and sustainable, but it often doesn't scale because you're essentially, uh, a lot of the time you're doing some kind of consultancy, you're doing some kind of hosting, and you're kind of limited by time or resources or money or the kind of market. And you might not have a, a complete fit, and competitors will often have more options, purely because, because they're proprietary or they can take on funding. Uh, lots of people in this space start with consultancy and productize over time, um, which, which is a really hard jump to make, so I'm not sure I would necessarily recommend it, and the key thing is to really follow the market. When you do this, you have to be flexible. You have to, to some extent, give, you know, you have to shift what you're going to do in response to what people will pay for. And that can be a really tough thing, but that's, that's the main way to, to make it work. Um, I found that a lot of people actually use openness and the open source nature of their project as a unique selling point, which increasingly is getting traction. So m a few years ago, that would be less of a selling point, but more and more, that's something that at least governments and lots of investors think is a really vital part. So in terms of membership crowdfunding campaigns, so lots of my friends who've kind of done open source projects as part of the sort of decentralization, like Mailpile, uh, did some kind of crowdfunding to try and get it. It's very um, sort of true to vision. You're, you're really getting people to buy into exactly the thing that you want to do, not what people are willing to pay for. Um, but it's really difficult. Like lots of projects just didn't manage to get the funding that they needed. Um, the cost of acquisition is really high. You have to do a lot of marketing. You have to have a huge amount of reach. You need to, to some extent, almost go viral to make this work. And you have to give people something for the fact that they're investing in you. So it's not, you know, it's not just all money, no matter what. Um, the, the key tactics that I've seen around this is really leveraging interest uh, so at the moment, obviously, the Facebook scandal or other interest is the thing that actually gets people um, to start joining up to and becoming members or joining a crowdfunding campaign. And lastly, um, in sort of, I'm just going to talk about grant funding because in, in the context of open source, investment and endowments are kind of less relevant. But most of the organizations that are institutional organizations working in the open space and doing open source rely on grant funding. Uh, there's a huge number of funders. So Shuttleworth is, is like, actually was first on my list as the most uh, famous one exactly for that. Um, but there are lots and lots of funders that fund open source and fund open institutions. And it has obviously the benefits of money, but the, um, the kind of cost is that actually it's just really hard to get that money. And even when you get that money, um, I mean, Shuttleworth has like a 1% success ratio or something to become a fellow. So, and they're really good because once they bind to you, 
you know, you kind of have a lot of freedom, but with most of these funders, um, it's n you're not going to get money that aligns exactly with the thing that you want to do. You're going to have to compromise what you do, and uh, there's a lot of reporting requirements. Um, proposals have to be tailored. It's just like a huge amount of investment, and it might not work out because the chances are quite low. So, and if you want to do funding, I actually probably won't go through this, but there's a huge amount of like work that has to go into understand what what they actually fund versus what they say they fund, who they are. You re you basically won't get funded unless you have some kind of personal network or connections in that space, and you need to align yourself with their mission. So, when you think about grant funding, it comes from some kind of endowment or some kind of fund where basically somebody decided, I want projects that really speak to this cool thing, so I want to look good by this thing succeeding, which could be you know, changes in digital health or better education, but they have an agenda in mind. And if your kind of project doesn't actually fit that agenda, it's going to be very difficult to, to get that kind of funding. So uh, yeah, and really quickly, on the kind of ICO fronts, um, I mean, this, some of this is a bit old. So this really works. I mean, IPFS got 250 million recently just by doing an ICO. Holochain did an ICO. I forget how much exactly they... they but basically, uh, the barriers were quite low to do it. At the moment, the hype cycle is there. Uh, the hype cycle will crash because it is a bubble. I, having known, ha I know a lot of the projects who have done ICOs quite well. And it, it is a lot of it is vaporware, so it's not going to last, and the regulators are already cracking down. So increasingly, lots of the people who are doing ICOs are having to move to different countries so they don't get prosecuted. But honestly, if you want to, you should go for it, because this is a really great sort of way of getting money at the moment. Just use the word blockchain and go to, go to crypto events. So the last thing I want to say is these are some of the tactics, but actually most people use a combination of Oh my god, my last slide. Oh, okay, most people use a combination, and uh, CCAN specifically, going back to CCAN, there's this really great slide, which is that slide again, but with the highlighted. Oh, okay, never mind. So, what I was going to end with was that CCAN specifically, my, my kind of project used unpaid labor it actually used it had grant funding uh, the founder who did the initial version was a Shuttleworth fellow um, and actually spent did the initial wrote the initial version of CCAN on Shuttleworth funding but we also did a huge amount of consultancy in product services and it's unlikely in my experience that it's you can successfully fund open source by only relying on one tactic I think you do need to be quite flexible because it is harder but and I'm going to actually just give, give up on this whole slide thing. But um, the thing that I would say is the most important is actually the context. So the environment that you're in um, and the, the opportunities that exist really matter. So the timing has to be right. There has to be a space for the thing to succeed. And the team that you have really needs to work. Like It's really hard to make anything happen as an individual. And if you have a team that you trust, and they trust you, and, they, and people know what they're talking about, and they are able to work together, then it's really possible to make and do something really amazing. And that's it. Thank you very much.